How's it going, everyone? It's me, Lone. I hope you're doing all right. Todd Howard has just revealed even more information about Starfield. Recently, he appeared on Kind of Funny's X-Cast. That is linked in the description below if you want to check out the full podcast for yourself. But today, I'm here to share everything that he talked about. And in addition, I will highlight some of the stuff that we didn't yet know about Starfield, which is really cool. If you enjoyed this video, please like. I would really appreciate it. And subscribe if you want to see even more Starfield content right until the launch of the game and beyond. But let's get right into it. So to start off, the podcast, Todd Howard was asked about the Starfield Direct. Why was it 45 minutes long? What was the thought process behind creating that Direct the way that it was? And Todd was pretty much like they wanted to give everyone a really deep dive look into the game and they were fortunate enough to have the Starfield Direct after the Xbox showcase. I genuinely wonder whether Bethesda Game Studios asked Xbox to have a separate presentation or whether it was the other way around because I could see Xbox being like, hey BGS, this is going to be our biggest title this year if not for our entire console generation, we really need a deep dive into the game. I suspect it was the former. I suspect Todd and the team wanted to go in detail the way that they did. And he even admitted, he was like, we, you know, it'd been a while since we talked about Starfield. I had talked about in previous videos, they had gone radio silent on the game for months and months and months, right? So I think Todd and the team suspected, and they knew clearly, that they needed to bring everything to the table. And he even said as well, it's a new IP, it's very ambitious, and they're taking a lot of risk with this, with this game. So when it comes to that, you need to take the time to explain a lot of those new systems to players. You need to take the time to explain what this IP is to people. This isn't Fallout, this isn't Elder Scrolls, I said this a lot. You, you can't just expect people have this instant knowledge of it. No one knew what Starfield was because it's brand, brand new, right? So they needed to take the time to explain everything. And I think they absolutely achieved that with the 45-minute Starfield Direct. Plus as well, he said, it allowed us to, to highlight a lot of the other people at BGS working on the game. And we saw tons of other devs, you know, in the audio department, doing art, production, etc., etc. So that was really cool to see a lot of the other people working on this game, because clearly there are a bunch of other people that we don't always hear about. So that was nice. Todd was asked about accessibility and Todd was like, there is actually a large font mode in Starfield. And he was talking about how, you know, there's a lot of stuff to read in that game. Clearly there's going to be a lot of lore in Starfield. And there's so many different monitor sizes. You can now stream Xbox games to your phone. So they wanted to have this feature to ensure that reading was a little bit easier, especially for those that might have difficulties with that. So it's cool to know that Starfield is going to have a large font mode out of the, out of the gate. He was asked specifically, is Starfield going to be Steam Deck compatible? He didn't say no. He said, we'll talk about that later. So hopefully we get some information about whether this game is going to be compatible with the Steam Deck. He was then asked about character creation. You know, what was the deal behind backgrounds and traits? And essentially he wanted the game to have depth even if you've been playing it for 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 100 hours on multiple playthroughs, you want those characters and those builds that you're creating to feel different and backgrounds and traits allow you to do that. Specifically on backgrounds, it's a bit of flavor right out of the gate. It allows you to pick starting skills and it allows people to role play as well. And you saw as well, and he mentions this, it factors into dialogue and the choices that you're making in the game. In the Starfield Direct, if you had a keen eye, you would have seen a lot of those conversations and there are options there depending upon the background that you you chose so always like that in a Bethesda Game Studios games and hopefully like there is a lot of variety in, in terms of the conversations and the things you can say and the responses you can get back and the things that happen based upon your your background because it will definitely allow for multiple playthroughs if you want to do something completely different depending upon what your background is in the game I hope it's that complex he also talked about traits and he was like specifically outright it's a throwback to Fallout Fallout had traits and we wanted to bring traits into Starfield. Really cool that he admitted that. Obviously, they're optional. You have positives and negatives with your traits, as we know, like with the adoring fan, etc. And it lets you play the game in a different way. So I, I appreciated the, the shout out to Fallout in that instance there. It's cool how a game that obviously didn't start within the Bethesda family has now influenced their first new IP in 25 years. Very, very cool. Uh, quickly, he was asked about the ranking system and how, you know, as you rank them up, the visual, you get the patches and stuff on your space suit, which is really, really cool. 
and he talked about how they were tiered. There's five of them. We saw a lot of that stuff in the Starfield Direct. Uh, is there a form of fishing in Starfield? There is not traditional fishing where you put your fishing rod into water and catch some fish. But he did say there's maybe a different kind of fishing. You might need to collect some fish. I have a feeling that has to do with the Aurora drug on the neon planet. You know how they you know propped up this entire economy based upon this hypertropic fish that they found. Maybe there is a side quest where you need to collect the fish and actually create the drug yourself. We saw some of those labs as well in the Starfield Direct. So I very much suspect there's probably going to be a, a, a side quest that's like to that effect, right? Maybe in the main quest as well. We don't, we don't really know, but he hinted around that. Then he was asked about the 1000 planets and the whole debate about around whether it's handcrafted or procedural. And the question was asked, when you get to these procedural planets, are there going to be things to do that are worth our time? So Todd was like, they had struggled with this in the early you know, stages of the project, right? And they wanted all of those planets because he felt in a game like this, open world RPG space game, that players would want there to be that many planets. Otherwise, it wouldn't really feel right. And I agree with him. I agree with him. If that's the kind of game that you're going for, having like 10 planets or 20 planets, wouldn't feel the same, but a thousand planets makes it really feel like one of those open world space adventures. And then they had to ask themselves, technically, could they pull that off? Could they make it feel believable? And obviously the answer was yes, they could eventually do that. And he's like, obviously it's procedural. Obviously there's no way that they could create a thousand planets and have all of that be handcrafted, literally physically impossible. But they do say they handcraft individual locations. And there are certain known like cities and, and, and quest areas where they're in very specific spots. So, you know, from player to player, from person to person, you can go to that exact spot and you'll find that city or you'll find that quest. But then there are other things that might, the location might vary depending upon the planet itself and where you're landing and stuff like that. So and he was talking about that in the Starfield Direct. You might come across something on a particular area on a certain planet that your friend playing the game might not see and, and they see something completely different. So there are planets with the known locations and then with those other procedural planets, things are mixed up depending upon where you go and, and, and there's a whole complex system behind that. And he said specifically, here's something new, about 10% of the 1,000 planets have life on them. So it seems a lot of the planets are like barren, purely for the resource generation. He specifically said 10% have life on them. So have those like alien creatures and stuff like that. So still 10% of, of 1,000 is still 100. That's a pretty big number. So I'm pretty happy with that. He was also saying if you add too many things like, you know, outposts to explore and caves to discover and stuff like that might feel a little bit too gamey. Um, so they didn't want to go crazy with that. Otherwise, every planet would feel like, you know, too, too gamey, as he said. So I can kind of get that. And he did say that exploration is definitely different to anything that they've done in, in previous Bethesda Game Studios games. And he said as well, like most of the time, you're landing, exploring the landing spot and the surrounding area, and then you're probably going somewhere else. He didn't really say like that you're actually walking around the entire surface of a planet after you're landing upon it. That's usually how you're not playing. So it's interesting. I think some people are going to challenge that status quo and they're probably going to explore entirety of planets and then they'll leave, right? <laughs> so we'll see. He was asked about uh, planets and biome diversity. He said there's a lot of biome, biomes, huge amount of biomes, and they do look at things like temperature and radiation. You can get certain ailments and, and certain weather effects if you're not ready. Specifically, he's talking about the spacesuit there that you wear because we know that they have different effects, different resistances. And if you're not ready for a certain planet, it will affect you in a negative. And he didn't say positive, but maybe a positive way. Maybe some, there's some cool stuff that that can happen depending upon the traits of the planet. Um, and he said some planets might just have one biome. Others might have a bunch of biomes on them. It depends on the planets themselves. But at least, you know, when there are different biomes the plants and the creatures all fit to those biomes so it's not like completely random there's a consistency with the biomes and the flora and fauna on those and he also said the planets have certain traits like usually geological things like and we saw a little bit of, uh, about that in the starfield direct certain planets have uh, you know certain iron levels and zinc levels and other kinds of minerals and again that comes into it when you're trying to resource farm and all that kind of stuff and he was saying if you do survey a planet fully we know that you can survey planets in starfield that's actually 
you are worth money. It's worth credits in the game, and you can sell that information. So you're encouraged when you land on a planet to survey everything because you can actually make some coin. Very, very cool. I, I really like that feature. It actually encourages you to explore to get a lot of that money, and then you can use that money with all the shipbuilding, which apparently is going to be very expensive. I'll talk about that later in the video. He did say as well, on certain planets, creatures can be like aggressive and get dangerous and kill some friendly creatures. So then you might be walking along and see some dead creatures and be like, holy crap, what the hell just happened? Probably because there's a, there's a dangerous creature around the corner, so you got to be careful. Really do like that. He was asked, uh, are there going to be like special iconic creatures like the Death Claw? He didn't go into too much information, but he said there's a really bad one. There is a really bad creature. I really want to know what he means by that. Like maybe it's like a little boss battle. That's going to be very cool. He was asked, is there a land vehicle or an option to ride creatures? No and no. There's no vehicle. You can't mount creatures and ride them. He wanted the game and they wanted the game to feel good on foot, on, on foot, sorry, but they do have a boost pack. So the boost pack is, is essentially your way of getting around planets and there are skills attached to that. It essentially, he said, it acts as the vehicle. Plus as well, there are certain planets, as we know, with different gravity levels that are going to allow you to jump and float way, way easier. So that's another form of transportation if you think about it. It was asked about companions. So obviously, if you don't want companions, you can play solo and there are traits that focus on solo and, and gives you and have certain skills with certain perks if you're playing alone without a companion. And he was saying as well, depending on the choices that you make, companions can get angry with you and the relationship with your companion will change based on the decisions that you, you've made. So this sounds a little bit more complex than the Fallout 4 system where companions are just like, oh, Paladin Dan's liked that or he disliked that. Hopefully there's actually some like repercussions for acting in a certain way and like you're pissing off your companion and they don't want to romance you anymore or it actually affects like how they feel about you, how they talk about you. I really want to see more information about that and how complex it really is. And of course, you can leave your companions behind, assign them to ships you're not using, outposts on random planets, etc. So if you want to abandon your companion, you can do that. And while he didn't say that, I'm sure there's a system where you can find where your companion you know, has been left. Because imagine if they're light years away and you don't know where they are and which planet you left them on, that would be pretty bad. Uh, he was asked, are the constellation companions the only ones who could be romance? This is a big one. The four ma main ones of constellations are the ones which support romance and for quest lines. So Sarah Morgan, Sam Coe, Barrett, and he said four, and I don't know if he's referring to Vasco there, and I don't think he is. I don't think Vasco is a, a companion that you can romance, but he said four specifically. So there must be another constellation companion, but they didn't. Re he, if there was, he should have revealed that. I don't know what he was getting at there. There's obviously other kinds of companions in Starfield, but when he's talking about the ones that specifically you can romance and there are quest lines attached to, he said it's those constellation ones, which are the main ones, right? So very, very interesting. He was asked as well, could all of your crew be robots? Technically, yes, right? Vasco, but obviously there's a few other things, other robots he didn't really talk about, but not really to the extent of having humans on your ship. It was asked about music. How do you build music into a game, an open world game like Starfield, and have the music hit at the exact right time? So we obviously reiterated, we knew this, that music is one of the first things that BGS start with. They have concept art and they write the music, and essentially the music allows them to feel what the experience of their games are going to be like. And he was saying that they built this whole system behind the music to determine like the mood and, and it'll pull depending upon where you are and the kind of mood Bethesda Game Studios wants to hit in that moment. They'll pull from a collection of tracks that will fit that mood and then they'll segue between those tracks. So very, and, and this is probably how their past games have worked as well, but it's not just the cycling through random tracks, right? Depending upon where you are, depending upon how Bethesda wants you to feel in that moment, they will pull from certain tracks that will add to that kind of mood. Really like that. I'm so excited to, to hear the full array of just ambient music that Einon Zer has created for Starfield. He was asked, is there going to be a space radio station? Technically there's one, but it, is only local to a certain location. So there's a little bit of that. It doesn't sound like there's like a, a Galaxy News radio, pardon the pun, but in Starfield, that one, one that can kind of reach 
the entirety of the galaxy no matter where you're exploring. It doesn't seem like that there is a radio like there is in Fallout. But there's a little one there, so that, that sounds nice. He was asked about shipbuilding and when it comes to stealing and buying ships. So whether you buy a ship or acquire it or steal it or whatever, they are all upgradable. But if you do steal a ship, you need to spend credits in order to register it and then you can upgrade it. So you need to register the ships that you get first through that method. But you can also still fly it around and use it, even if you steal them. He said it was a very deep system and one that he expects players to be utilizing in the late game because it costs so much money. It costs a lot of credits. In a good way, he says it's a complicated system, but it's not for the early game, right? He did say, though, that obviously in the early game, you can still upgrade simple things like your weapons and the shields and the grav drive, etc. But the full building mode, the one that they really got into it where you had the different modules and you can get in depth in terms of what you're creating and create like mechs and ships that look like insects and stuff like that that's a long-term thing and that's what, something that you need a lot of money for and i assume that's the stuff that you're going to need to build your outpost generate resources and just have an entire economy you know generating wealth for you and then you can build your crazy spaceship so or you could probably just use console commands who really knows next up he was asked what if you have contraband before entering a planet as you know before you enter certain planets you're scanned to see if you have contraband. And Todd was like, you're going to have to wait and see on that. Uh, faster than light speed travel. What's the law behind that like? Obviously, we know that you can use the grav drive to, to travel incredibly large distances, way faster than the speed of light. And Todd said, yeah, there's definitely law behind the, the way that you travel in, in, star, in Starfield on your spaceship. Specifically, it's called the Gravitron Loop Field Array, where you bend space and essentially space is being brought towards you. That's how you're traveling in Starfield in your spaceship. They read a lot of papers on warp drives and quantum physics, and they definitely have that law built into the game. Very, very cool. And he even said this, like with the gravity in the game, for instance, he said it's something around it like affects people in the universe how they how you bend gravity certain people in the game feel a certain way about that i don't know what he was getting at maybe it's like the the western planet they don't believe in a lot of that stuff very interesting what he was touching on i want to know exactly what he meant and then they were saying yeah he spent a lot of time working at the fiction of the universe that they're building it's still a video game it's not super realistic but he still wanted to keep it grounded to some extent he said he wanted to make it feel believable, at least for the reality of the game that they've created. Next up, he was asked about new tech. What's it been like working with the new tech? We've heard for a very long time, Todd's been like, we have so much that we want to do with the game, and what we wanted to do with Starfield was only technically possible now because of the tech that we have and the new engine that we have. And they, he said they're very, very happy with the new engine. What they can do now, things look amazing, and they're, it's running really great in his opinion with items and people and spaceships and the lighting model, the planets, the real-time GI. He even mentioned there's going to be volumetric fog as well, and we didn't see much of that in the, in the Starfield Direct. So all of these different systems, he can only they can only really do because of this of this new engine. So it seems like they have put a lot of time and effort into the new engine. And I've said, I suspect that's why it took so long for Starfield to be developed because they had to spend years and years clearly creating the new engine and then creating the game. There were two different things that needed to go on there. And I'm sure it happened simultaneously, concurrently at the same time. They, he said that they had a specific team working on creating and upgrading that new engine. So very cool to hear about that. And he also talked about the quest system, how the engine helps with that. Because with their games, you have so many quests that are running at the exact same time. You can have tons and tons and tons. You're not just doing one at any one time. So the new engine helps you know create some magic moments it's chaos it's chaotic but it creates some magic moments he was asked specifically when about the whole 4k 30 frames per second debate was it ever under consideration to do a performance mode and take away some of the features like you know questing and spaceship building and stuff like that that would that never cross todd and the team's mind they always wanted to deliver on all of those features and they prefer consistency over having a performance mode so they want but they he still said now this is it doesn't get me concerned but he was like even though it's 30 frames per second there's still certain things that they can do to make the game feel great and he mentioned motion blur and he was like things like motion blur how fast the game refreshes to your controller input there are certain things that they can do that still makes the game feel great and smooth even at 30 frames per second 
I still hope there is a is a way to disable motion blur or that there's a mod that allows us to do that. I understand that motion blur can make things seem smoother. Sometimes it just doesn't look good. I, I was playing Final Fantasy 16 recently and it doesn't look good. I don't think I've ever liked motion blur in a game. So I hope that it's able to be disabled, but we don't know yet that yet. He was asked as well about side quest. There's a lot of side quests. There's a lot of random ones, one-off ones, like fetch questy ones. We know that. Sometimes when you land on a planet, it's like you need to build an outpost or do stuff like that. But he did say as well that that shouldn't take the place of more in-depth side quests. And there's a lot and a lot of those in-depth side quests. So very, very exciting. He was asked about modding. He said Starfield's going to be a modder's paradise. They had a lot of focus. He said it was important for them to make it as easy as possible for modders to turn this into a career. And they're looking forward to seeing what modders can do with Starfield. He keeps talking about that. They talked about that a few months back or last year, I believe it was. He still can't get the idea out of his head that he wants to help modders turn this into a career and actually do this full time. I suspect based on what he's saying, at some stage, we might see a return of Creation Club because of that, where modders can create mods and get a bit of money for that. I, I'm really for modders getting paid 1,010%, and it just the system needs to be fair. They need to get a really good cut um, because before it was like a, it was an interesting split between what Bethesda got and modders got and Steam got, if you remember that, Steam was part of that process as well, what all of those parties got when a mod was sold. So they need to get that right. And they also, I think the prices need to be reduced as well because people are so used to, to getting mods for free and to tell them that now it's $20 for this particular mod. It's a, it, there needs to be a transition period. So hopefully mods are a little bit cheaper if Creation Club does return. Then he was asked about outposts. Can you build whatever you want or do you need like certain resources? Again, he said outposts is a very deep system. You do need a lot of resources. It's one of those end game things. It's not an early game thing. And you also need to develop your character skills and, and, and again, collect a lot of resources to go crazy with that. Here's another new thing as well. He says you can shuttle cargo between planets so you can have outposts on different planets and they shuttle cargo between each other so maybe it's like you you're on a certain planet with certain resources certain minerals and you get a bunch of that there and you're you know shuttling that cargo to another planet with another outpost and you need to build certain things on that one and you don't have the minerals available to 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 farm on that planet hopefully it's something as cool as that right because it doesn't seem like that you just like have your inventory no matter which planet that you're on and you can draw upon that pool, right? It seems like, from what he's saying, the resources and the stuff that you collect is tied to the outpost on that particular planet. And if you want to get it to another planet, you're going to have to shuttle it across. I like that. It sounds very, very cool, Todd. Keep telling me, keep saying sweet things to me. And he was asked a question, are there black holes? He passed on it. He didn't want to say whether there were black holes in Starfield or not. I reckon there might be. I don't know. But it sounds like he could have just said, no, there's not. Like with fishing. He said, no, there's no fishing. But he passed on this question. So I reckon black holes, there might be something with black holes. Maybe a quest tied with them. Something that you can do. Very, very exciting. And last question, can Vasco wear a hat? Not currently. And that was it. That was uh, everything that Todd really talked about during the X cast. I had to you know, briefly run through a lot of those stuff because there was a lot. Again, if you want to watch the full video, linked in the description below. Let me know what you think in the comments. I'm really keen on certain things here. The black holes thing really, really intrigues me. The, the law behind light speed travel, I'm super into that kind of stuff. But yeah, let me know what you think. Let me know what you think about some of the new stuff that we haven't heard about yet. And until next time, this has been Lone. Please take care of yourselves. And would you kindly keep fighting the good fight.